Josh Pate is over at 247 Sports. He is on Twitter at Late Kick Josh. Uh, his YouTube uh, updates at the end of the day are must watch. I'm telling you, if you are a college football fan, make sure that you subscribe, get alerts, and get set up for uh, for his uh, his late kick his late kick Josh stuff that happens over on YouTube. You can follow him there. Just follow him on Twitter, and you can keep up with everything. He's been here before, and we have him back again here on this Thursday morning. Josh, good morning. How are you, man? I'm good, but I really need to know scale of one to ten. How bad is it down there right now? Uh, ten 12. being the worst. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'd go thirteen or fourteen at this point. Um, okay, fair enough. Okay, good starting point. All right, let's talk about it. <laughs> I mean, look, you you've got players yesterday: Ed Ingram and Liam Shanahan, two of your your veteran offensive linemen. Shanahan starting center, Ingram starting left guard. That come out and say openly into the public, Josh, that they were not prepared to play on Saturday. Shanahan said they saw some things that they have not seen and weren't ready for, and then Ed Ingram says into the public yesterday and. Made, uh, media availability that they may be out of shape and tired. I just e- even if you you feel like that within a program, you rarely see those comments hit the streets, especially from veterans. It seems as if this LSU program right now is splintered from the top into the locker room. I, I think that that's probably at the baseline the issue that LSU is dealing with. But to see them play on Saturday night, what did you take away from it? Uh, well, it was ugly and i'll tell you also a lot of stuff when you hear it in the summer it's just you take it for what it's worth you know i cannot tell you and you guys know good and well this is the case i cannot tell you how many times i've had folks tell me oh we've never had a better off season we've Uh never had a better blah 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 and then you get the season and you see you know what you see well on the other side there have been times before where i've heard oh man things aren't always things that things haven't been exactly from a chemistry standpoint, the way we want to see him. And -and so-and-so has been trouble in the offseason. And then they, you know, run the table undefeated. So you just learn to take that stuff for what it is. And so when I was told during the summer uh, by, you know, someone on that team that that locker room was not in a good place still, I listened and I filed it away. And I said, well, you know what, if that's true, it won't take six games into the season to know if it's valid. We'll know against UCLA. Lo and behold, we watched the game and the exact same problems that we saw last year and felt last year were on display. Because that's not, that's not one of those bounce of ball, you know, minus two turnovers, freak occurrence losses. That's one of the losses that if you really want to diagnose the problems, stem all the way back to last year. And listen, when you've got respect for your organization, even if you knew you were unprepared, you don't let that stuff get out. Right. People know what they're doing, man. Like when words come out of your mouth in a press setting that you've been coached on how to act in, they're measured. And nine times out of ten, they're measured. And so when guys are letting you know that, because they want to let you know that. And that is exactly what I would deduce from what you just said is, yeah, you got a, you got a splintered culture, and it looks like you want some people to know about it. Yeah, it is, it is overly concerning after week one to hear some of the messages coming out of the veteran leaders inside the locker room uh, from LSU. When you see this, is it fixable, in your opinion? I don't know. I don't know if it's fixable given, given the current structure there. But I'll tell you, I'd love for it to be fixable. So I don't speak you know, negatively just sure. for the sake of being negative. But like, if we break this down, like we just said, the problem's not a technique here and there. The problem's not just, well, lower-level execution just needs to improve here and there. If it's, if it's systemic and if your problem is intangible in nature, if your problem is more foundational and cultural and you, just, you don't have the buy-in, what do you fix week one to week two or week, week four to week six? What do you really fix? I don't, know that, I don't know that if you didn't have that answer already, you find that answer during the season. Yeah, Josh Pate is joining us here on the uh, Jordy Collada Show. If you have not found his work, make sure that you follow and subscribe to 247 Sports on YouTube. Uh, his recaps at the end of the day are the best. I'm telling you, you learn uh, everything that you need to know, not only about the SEC, but about college football uh, all in all. And make sure that uh, you are following him on Twitter, at Late Kick Josh, to keep up with the latest. Most impressive thing you saw last weekend, Alabama or Georgia? It was Alabama. 
I was on the field for that Georgia game, though. So let me start with my number two. Okay. Uh, I've never, ever, ever in a big game seen the kind of domination that they had on the line of scrimmage. A lot of times with three and four guys. And it was, I think, even a shot to the senses of Clemson's staff. And they know what they have and they know what they don't have. Uh, it, it, it almost got to the point where I don't even know that the Clemson offensive line is the proper gauge to judge how dominant Georgia's defense can be. Now think about that for a wow. second. Because it's yeah. not like we're talking about, you know, Alcorn State. We're talking about Clemson ranked in the top five. And we're talking about them posing so little a challenge along the offensive line that I say, well, wait till Georgia plays a better team. You're just not used to thinking that way about Clemson. Uh, but Georgia looked very good. But when I was at that game, you know, sometimes you, when you're covering a game, you got other games on TV, so you'll glance over there. And I glanced over there about the time Derek King got knocked down fourth or fifth time already in the game. And I looked at the score and I looked at the style of game that was unfolding. And I thought to myself, how disheartening must that be? For other programs out here, we got Washington falling to Montana. I mean, we got LSU out on the West Coast losing. We got Oklahoma struggling to get by against Tulane, and there's Alabama against the top 20 team drowning them just as they usually do. Uh, what fascinates me now is if you listen to Nick Saban this week, he already knows what's setting in up there because mm-hmm. everybody has heard what they're saying about him, and he's got and he's got some of his best ever sound that happens during the worst weeks. Mercer or Georgia Southern, but it's really everything that people laugh about with Saban and, you know, taking a joking manner, even though he's serious, is what makes them what they are. You've got a guy irate over a 44-13 win and what people's attitudes are, and then you got people elsewhere who would literally give a limb or possibly two in some cases <laughs> to just trade places with them. That's so true. I think the Jaleel Billingsley story is, is, is another testament to his greatness. I mean, it, it, a lot of people in today's world, Billingsley, of course, a former five-star tight end, going through some things off the field in Tuscaloosa that Saban is using playing time and football to discipline him with, and to see his dad come out and make a comment and saying, this is why we sent him to Alabama to play for this, this type of coach. And it, it seems like those types of personalities in today's world, they transfer. They leave a program and go play somewhere else, and you still see his coaching technique working in a day and age that, that, you know, overwhelmingly, that doesn't seem like that's the vibe in sports anymore. Right. If you're receptive to it, that technique will always work. I agree. And what I've always thought is, yes, there is a prevailing mood in any generation, but there are always exceptions to that mood. And luckily, if you're Alabama or if you're LSU and you have things going right or Texas A&M, you don't have to sign 400 kids a year. you got to go find 25 of them. Mm-hmm. And there are, in any given class, well over 25 exceptions to the rule out there that are also talented enough to play at a high level for you. But I remember there was a kid they had not too long ago named DJ Petway. Yeah. And Petway got in some trouble, and they actually had to send him off to JUCO. And Petway goes to JUCO, gets his life together. They bring him back, and he's a playing on championship teams again when he comes back. And it was it was covered by the Alabama beat, but it wasn't a real national story, and I wish it would have been. Well, so that's what redemption's about. But also with Jaleel Billingsley, man, when you're loaded enough that you can sit by far your best tight end and then put a former linebacker in his place that goes and scores two touchdowns, that's called depth. <laughs> Josh Pate, at Late Kick Josh is where you follow him on Twitter. How good was Georgia? How, good, how fast was that defense from the field level? They looked really good. Uh, I think their secondary, I, I think, probably was even a little better and performed at a little higher level than they expected. But, again, it would be fair if you were to come to me. Like, if I were to call you and say, Jordy, did you watch the game? And you said, yep. I said, man, what about that defense? If you were to tell me, they look great, Josh, but, look, let's calm ourselves because I don't really know how much that secondary got tested. You know, when you got about .75 seconds to throw the ball, secondary does not tend to get tested a whole lot. I mean, you get a guy running for his life and seeing ghosts after the first quarter. Secondary doesn't normally get tested. I still think secondary, and to an extent maybe the depth, that outside linebacker is something that is going to be something to watch with Georgia this year defensively. But absolutely, that front is going to render a lot of that irrelevant. There are only going to be a few offensive lines, and there are going to only be really a few teams that are able to somewhat neutralize that in order to test that secondary out. And that's probably doesn't come for quite a while you know they're talking right now about 
JT Daniels and can he play this week or can he not? It would be fair to look at that schedule and say they've got enough backup quarterback talent to get them through the next several games. I mean, people say SEC schedule, and I've never believed in saying that. Say schedule and then tell me who you play. Because if you are playing a schedule where your next toughest games right now are going to be Auburn and then neutral side against Florida several weeks down the road, and then that's kind of it unless something else pops up, it's not exactly the murderer's row that Arkansas is playing this year is what I'm saying. So they looked really good. They were really, really encouraged because one of the hidden factors of that game was how there has been behind the scenes a little bit more whisper and a little bit more grumble as of late in the recruiting world about people needing to see results from Georgia. Mm. And I talked to some of our guys, and they said, I know America thinks Clemson needs this game more. No, Georgia needs the game more. Uh, Because if they don't win any of these big games, if they lose another one on a national stage, it all of a sudden becomes recruits getting tired of cotton candy and wanting some steak. Quit, Quit selling me on future. Quit selling me on vision. You haven't been here two years. You've been here six years now. I got to see you win big games because these other programs that have offered me, they're the ones beating you on those big stages. That's why they needed that one so much. Did you see enough from JT Daniels to buy into the offense to think that they could be competitive down the, the stretch against teams like Alabama if they faced them in Georgia? No, absolutely not. Hmm. Uh, but I do believe that they will be there. I, I do believe they'll be able to, but it certainly wouldn't have been because of watching that game. But I'll give them credit now. As much as I do believe that that Georgia staff has bought in, to overhauling that offense, maybe even as early as last year, and then whatever happens, happens. I believe they're bought into it, but I also believe just because you walk into a game with a playbook with a certain number of plays on it or a play sheet with a certain number of plays on it doesn't mean you have to call every one of them. It's been one of the most one of the most fascinating and, and maddening things I've seen in the past is coaches will get into a game, and they'll see it play out, and the path to victory will be so clear. But because we practiced these plays this week, we got to run them, and then you end up turning the ball over and you lose the game. They had to have realized about a, probably half a quarter to a quarter in, unless we help them out, Clemson cannot score on us. So it does not behoove us. If your goal is to win this game, it doesn't behoove us to put ball in the air 30 times. Hmm. Now, having said that, what it probably does is it lowers expectation for Georgia's offense, and I still think when they get that receiver room back, I think they're going to be capable of doing a lot. I don't know that they're going to be on Bama's level, but they're going to be capable, I think, of still surprising some people offensively because I do think that offense is going to be good. And I think it's going to be improved through the air. I think it's going to look a little bit different than you've ever seen from Georgia. The question that we now have 11 weeks to figure out, really, is how far can they come? It's very rare that you have sort of the die cast this early in the year. But unless you have catastrophic injury out there, it looks like Alabama's the cream of the crop. And then you start asking yourself, all right, how much can Georgia get done? It's basically, here's the way I look at it. The way they ended 2019, humiliating loss, blowout loss to LSU in the SEC title game, which I think they played decently defensively. LSU just overwhelmed them eventually. Well, they left that year saying, boy, even when we play good defense, we can't match these offenses. Well, that was the end of 2019. Maybe that's the beginning of 2021. we got a dominant defense, offense. Now we are going to have to improve, or else if we get in that setting again, we're not going to be able to trade points because there's a certain level of offense out there that's going to score on us no matter how good our defense is. Number 12, Oregon is traveling to the Horseshoe this weekend to take on Ohio State. That seems to be the national game of the weekend that everybody's paying attention to. Does Texas and Arkansas grip you? If not, what are you watching this weekend? No, Texas and Arkansas absolutely grips me. I, I watched K.J. Jefferson last week. I, I actually put myself through the Arkansas Rice game, and I watched oh. K.J. Jefferson. And, look, when he runs the ball, better things happen for Arkansas. And if they're to win that game, which is only a six-and-a-half-point spread, it's doable. I mean, Virginia Tech pulled off a game very similar to North Car- against North Carolina last week. If they are to pull off that game, I think they got to run him 15 times minimum. It needs to be an old Cam Newton special. And they can do that. It's also one of the first, it is the first opportunity for those Texas young players, including a first-time starter in Hudson Carr, to get exposed to crowd noise at that level. So that's something I'm watching. Uh, Oregon's got to open things up, man. Mm -hmm. They have got to leverage the talent that they do now have at receiver. There are questions in the Ohio State secondary. You, as Oregon, don't know if you're going to have Thibodeau, your best player, maybe the best player in the nation, 
you you got to go in that game knowing we have to have 30 minimum to win. And they don't coach like that normally. They don't call plays like that normally. But the game I'm going to be at is Iowa-Iowa State, yeah. which has me fascinated and has all year. I think that'll be one of the best scenes in the entire year for college football and one of those that makes you watch and just lose yourself in a Saturday and have a couldn't care less mentality about how it impacts the playoff because that's okay for a college football fans. It's okay to watch a game and not care about the playoff. That's kind of how the sport's supposed to be. What's the end game on Matt Campbell? I'll get you out of here on this one. He turned down the Jets job in the offseason. What, what's, what's his goal, in your opinion? I think his goal is happiness, and uh-huh. which is easy to say because that's all of us. The question is, does he have it at Iowa State? So that would be one of the first times a guy has a limitless ceiling and just chooses happiness at a place that maybe you view or, or the public view as Tier 3 or Tier 4. Uh, but everybody is waiting for the Michigan job. That's what uh, they're waiting on with Campbell. They're waiting to see gotcha. what happens with the Michigan job, and then we'll fill in the blank. Got gotcha. you. Josh, you're the best, man. Loved your work. Thank you, as, uh, thank you for starting this Thursday with us, and enjoy the college football weekend. We'll be checking in again soon. Happy to do it, guys. Have a good weekend. All right, man. See you. There is uh, Josh Pate with uh, uh, Late Kick with Josh, which is a fantastic watch. Listen, if you're looking to get caught up on college football, if you're looking for the latest – Uh, And some really good takes. He's got really good relationships. He's obviously tied in to a lot of the schools around the conference, around the country. As you heard there, he'll be over at uh, Iowa and Iowa State this weekend.